we are going to take a little vacation because the uh, the young fellow who was going to tell us about uh, virtualization just uh, went, went virtual on us. <laughs> he had to leave. And anyway, I couldn't find a replacement. So next week, this has the word that we need to show up. The following week, we will definitely have a speaker. So it's one week as well. But today, I have the honor and the pleasure of introducing Louis Gasparini. He was with Pathway Security, now with RSA. He is going to tell us about authentication. Great. Thanks. Yeah, if you're running late, I will be pointing to mine. That's fine. Great. Well, thanks. Nice, nice to meet you all. Um, I'm Louis Gasparini. I'll introduce myself in a second. I'm going to talk to you about emerging authentication on the Internet. And uh, on the Internet, you know, it's, uh, it's a wild west out there. You remember, some of us remember the old cartoon of the dog sitting in front of the terminal saying, nobody knows you're a dog on the Internet. And it's still true. But before I get into my talk, I want to tell you who I claim to be. These are my identity claims. This is what I have to say about myself. My name is Louis Gasparini. I'm over 21, and I'm under 35. I went to school at the University of San Francisco, where I met George, and I played hockey. But I'm not a Canadian, eh? I used to work at Wells Fargo, built an internet banking system at Wells Fargo, then went to work at Excited Home. Started a company, Passmark Security, which was bought by a company called RSA, which was then bought by another company called EMC. So those are my identity claims. Do you believe me? Am I telling you the truth? I don't know about the hockey part. Hockey's true. <laughs> the hockey's true. Um, you don't know. How do you know I'm telling the truth? Well, actually, I'm not under 35. A little bit over 35. <laughs> Won't get into how much. Um, so, how do you really know? Here's a, here's a picture of a Customs Border Patrol officer taking a look at a car that's coming in the border, and he's checking the license plate. He's probably checking the driver's license, the passport. He's looking at the guy. He's looking for known terrorist files and other stuff. He's looking at a lot of different information to make a decision. It used to be the authentication was binary. I'd see your passport. I'd see your username password. Yes, no. Your biometric. Your fingerprint. Yes, no. Credential, software credential, hardware token, which made RSA famous, yes or no. I think we've changed from that, and now authentication has become sort of granular, shades of gray. Oh, do I think that's George? Well, I've seen him before. He looks a little, little bit older since I've seen him last, but yeah, that's George. I think it's George. I'll give him a thumbs up. But, you know, you don't know. If I was on the Internet talking to George, how would I be sure? Um, you know, in the banking community, which I speak a lot to, because a lot of the stuff that I work on is in the banking sector. Um, there's a, everybody in the banking sector knows Slick Willie. And this is a, a real person. You know, he robbed hundreds of banks in the 1920s. He executed uh, robberies in disguise. And people described him as a gentleman, quite polite. In fact, you know, they, they felt um, entertained by being robbed by Slick Willie. And when he, when, it was, when he was asked, why does he rob banks? He simply replied, well, that's where the money is. And that's where the money is. Fraudsters are very motivated, financially motivated, to be able to get to that money. In order to get to that money, in a lot of cases today, they're looking to steal your identity, your credentials, and impersonate you. Um, actually, this is out of today's uh, news. I, uh, at work, you know, I get a lot of uh, daily bulletin stuff, and I noticed this this morning. And I found it interesting, so I just pasted it in, into the presentation today. Security experts, rock fishing um, is behind growing net fraud. Uh, this is from USA Today. A recent surge in phishing, fraudulent emails and websites designed to fish sensitive information, uh, such as passwords, credit cards, is the handiwork of a small, shadowy cyber gang, computer experts say. Rockfish got its name because of the way the word rock is used in website addresses. It is believed to be Eastern European, uh, based on widespread availability of phishing tools and websites hosted in that reason, region. In July of this year, the anti-phishing working group said the number of sites, phishing sites pole vaulted from about 31,000 um, to 231,000 from about 14,000 a year ago as a, as a run rate for the year. I mean, and I've been in this industry about three or four years now watching phishing, and, and it's just been going like this. It's moneymaker. You know, you, you think about it, I'm sure... Everybody understands what phishing is, right? If you don't, 
<laughs> be careful. <laughs> be careful out there. Um, it's an email. How do you know it's the real bank? How do you know it's the real person asking you to supply information? Um, they get take rates that some of the marketing folks would, would drool for. You know, people will click on these things and supply information. I've been in this industry for a year or two, uh, um, about a year or two ago. My wife got an email from eBay. She was that close to typing in her information, her credit card and everything. Finally, she decided to call me. Hey, I'm not sure about this. I said, wait, stop. I had her check a few things. Well, it was from Korea, is where the site that went to went, was. It was definitely, it was a fish. They, she, it got, she got lucky. They got lucky. They, um, they said to her, a recent purchase you made had a problem. Click here to confirm your credit card number. Well, she happened to have had a recent purchase in PayPal the night before. Just luck. Percentage. They're playing the percentages. You send out hundreds of millions of emails, odds are you're going to find something that clicks like that, and the person's going to fall for it. So how do you know? What do you do? Well, you know, we can get into, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about general authentication, you know, solutions. You know, there's RFID. That's looking pretty popular. They're starting to show up in passports. Uh, theme parts are using them. Even an interesting tag on the bottom, Viagra bottles now have RFID tags in there to prevent counterfeiting. Um, but you're not going to use that on the internet. Uh, facial scan also is, is a solution that has some merit. But again, these things are not going to be used on the internet. Palm technology, reading the veins. In Japan, they're using this because it's little, they're culturally, they don't want to touch a lot of items with your hands. So they have this now palm technology where you just put it over something and it scans and reads your veins to identify you. And that's in pilot there. Um, fingerprint readers. Um, a lot of folks have thought, you know, fingerprint readers would be the great solution. You know, perhaps one day when they're in every device shipped, they might be um, a bit a bit easier to use for the general pop population. Um, right now, they're still used mainly internally in, in enterprises behind the firewall. Um, problem with fingerprint readers is once somebody steals your fingerprint, you're really in trouble. What are you going to do there? You can't revoke your fingerprint and take it back. Um, there's a lot of schemes in place of how you can crypt cryptographically um, seal that before it's delivered. So there's still a lot of work to go um, to really bulletproof how authentication works. It's amazing. No matter what you do, there's a way to work around it, you know, which is why I say authentication has to become shades of gray. Because you can't look at any one single thing you can name anything to me, and I'll tell you a way around it. Um, you know, just a little slide about how fingerprints work. Again, I'm not going to get into this in any detail. I'm going to keep on moving through. Um, voice prints are, are something else that's pretty interesting. We're seeing a little bit more of that. Starting to experiment with that in the banking industry and call centers. Um, you know, the way the voice prints works, it, it takes up my the analog of my voice breaks it down into sections. And then based upon that, it, it, it creates some, some frequency um, analysis. And so I have a very bassy voice. It, it, it looks at the characteristics of my voice. So it's not looking at particular words I'm saying. So it's word independent. It's the characteristic of my voice. Now, in order to have a good voice biometric, you need about a good minute or two minute of sample time. And that's a little hard to do. So one of the big issues in sort of mass market consumer for voice biometric is how do you enroll everybody? How do you get the person enrolled the first time? You know, are they going to go through the enrollment process? And then there's all these other things that pop up. What about privacy? A lot of uh, folks in the privacy world get worried that once you give up your voice print uh, someplace, now you're going to be tracked when you use your voice print elsewhere. There's actually a few interesting ideas that are out there that we've had, and I've talked to a startup company just the other day that's looking at this too. What if we took voice prints of known criminals? What if you took voice prints of fraudsters? And now when somebody looks to apply for a credit card or a loan or something in your name, you know, that print can be uh, tested against known fraudsters to see if it's actually uh, um, a criminal that's trying to uh, impersonate you. And that has some merit. So there's lots of things that have some merit. It's still, it's still a very early field. Um, I can't give a talk without at least saluting once the RSA uh, token. Um, RSA, which is where I'm, I'm, I'm working at right now. 
um, is famous for its, uh, its, its physical token. Gee, I don't even have mine handy. It's in my backpack. But many of you have seen it. It's those little physical tokens that have the uh, you know, changeable display. Um, you know, in case you don't know how it works, let me, let me tell you a bit about how it works. Basically, it's, it's a hashing algorithm. Everybody know what a hashing algorithm is? You, know, you take, you, you take a, a number, you, ha you take a string, you, you hash it with, a, with a, a seed, and that's the internal seed. That's the key. That's the main key. And then, and then comes out um, uh, a, a, a token, which is really one way. You can't, you can't go the other way. You can't get the seed back. So you take a seed. Um, and then with this one, what RSA has done, uh, George and I were talking about this, what their patent has done, is taken a clock, an internal clock, combine it with the seed, and together that becomes the hash um, that is then hashed and creates the passcode. And so that's how, so it's, it's a time-based one-time password. There are other ones called event-based, where essentially you, you click and it generates a new one. It's a sequence number. It's almost like having a sequence on a list on a piece of paper, just scratching off the next one. Actually, in, in, in Europe, in Germany, in many countries over there, they have cards that banks send you, and literally you scratch off a number. And then when you're done with your card, you get a new one in the mail. And so the event-based algorithm is very, it would be a, essentially an automated example of just that. RSA's is time-based, so it takes a clock and it uses it, and then so in, as 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 the uh, as the C, uh, as a passcode generation. So there's a little clock inside of the uh, the token. So then you you get your token, you type it into the web screen or wherever you need to type it into, and essentially on the server it's got essentially the same clock. It's GMT time synced, so it's pretty much synced to the battery that's in that little token you have that has its clock. And there's a little bit of drift, and it actually accounts for drift. Um, why, if, if, you, if you get one wrong, it asks you for another one. If it sees it's right, it'll actually adjust its drift clock per unit. So it's a little bit of adjustment there. It's interesting. So it'll, it'll check the two, and, and then, oh, I forgot there's a little truncation because some of the hashing is too big. I didn't mention that earlier. Make it digestible, eight, eight, eight numbers. And then comparison, that's how it works. So that's how the, the general token works. Now that works pretty good. And that would help solve a lot of identity <coughs> theft and phishing, because every time you use, want to sign into your bank or a secure service or something, if you use that, that'd be good. But then everybody would happen to carry one. And so the big problem is, you know, how do you get that distributed to all the people? The other problem is, if you're working with a bank or a person that distributes it, if you have, let's say many people have credit cards, bank, maybe brokerage, um, and other other uh, financial instruments, they might have four financial banks, financial services companies they do business with. Do they have four tokens? And you have this, what we call the token necklace problem. You know, you've probably seen that. Uh, your sys admin, I don't know if he's still here, he's probably got a token necklace problem if he has to log into many different secure systems. So that, that's the problem there. So what do you do? Well, um, as, as uh, George said and I said earlier, um, I had started a company called Passmark Security. Um, one of the things Passmark Security did was say, you don't need no stinking tokens. It's too difficult. Why do we want to use hardware distribution to the mass market in order to protect secure services? Online banking being the primary example, right? Um, username password's not good enough. We're seeing that with phishing, the slick willies, the Russian mafia, um, many K Korean gangs. There's many examples of, of, of folks that are focused on getting your credentials and, and, and uh, compromising that area. Um, so username and password is not good enough, and, and tokens are too heavyweight. Software certificates, we can talk about that. They're, they're a mess too, hard to distribute, hard to control. So the whole idea here is let's use your device as a token. This, this becomes your token, and let's link you to your device. And So now I've got username, password, and my device. And now that's, that's what I need. We were talking earlier about two factors, three factors of authentication. Well, here, here's a quasi-third factor, my device. It's third factor. So how do we use the device as an, as, an, as an identifying factor? What we do is we look at, we say, have we seen this device before? Um, how do we know it's the same device? Forensics. Are the device characteristics consistent? There's a lot of 
detail, actually this slide doesn't go into it very well, there's a lot of detail that we can see about a device, and anybody can see about a device, by the way, without special privileges. I mean, obviously, once you put software on a device, we can interact with that software. We can get pretty granular. But most people don't want to install software on their device. It's difficult. Most banks don't want to have you install software because once you do, as soon as you, yeah, as soon as you have a problem, you're going to call the bank back if it's their problem. And this does happen all the time. So putting software, requiring a customer to use, to download software like toolbars or something like that, even eBay's got a toolbar, PayPal's got a toolbar, they're seeing 5%, 10% take rate. Software downloads don't seem to work that well. This works for everybody. We, take, we, we can see quite a, things on your uh, uh, quite a bit of information on your device. We can put a secure cookie on there, a unique device identifier, which is what we'll do. That's only re re readable by the domain, bankofamerica.com, that said it. We could put the same cookie inside of other, other uh, software that accepts cookies like that. Macromedia Flash has a thing called Flash Shared Objects. We could put a device identifier, it's encrypted, stick it in a Flash Shared Object. We could take a fingerprint of your machine. I can tell you what operating system you're running, what browser version you have, how many MIME types you support, what language settings you, you have, what your clock setting is, what your version of JavaScript is, if you have it enabled, what version of a handful of Microsoft software is. We can create a fairly decent fingerprint of this machine. And that's what we do. We take that fingerprint and we, 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 we sort of make an identifier for this machine. We can also look at, I'm going to skip some of this and come back, we could also look at the network information. What is the IP address you're coming from? What does that translate into with respect to uh, um, city, location, carrier? I always use Comcast in San Mateo. So that's my home location carrier. Sometimes I come in from RSA network and it looks like it's coming out of Massachusetts because that's where our corporate proxies are. Well, that's my alternative home and carrier. So I'm mobile. I travel a lot. So I'm a person that would be now down the behavioral identification. And this is the fourth factor that George and I talked about earlier. Um, I'm not sure if it exactly fit your definition of fourth. I think it did. But this is, this is my definition of the fourth factor. What is behavior? Is this normal behavior for Louie? Is this normal behavior for Louie's machine? You know, is Louie always log in from a, from a machine at, in one network location, so he's home, a home person only? Or is he two, home and work? And by the way, many people, the average we're seeing is about 2.2, 2.3 devices per person. Something around there. It's, it's you know, home, work, and, and well, I think actually 1.7 maybe it was. I forget now. But it's around two, home and work. Um, but I'm, I'm global. I travel a lot. And so uh, for me, it's going to be normal to see me in the US and Europe and Japan and elsewhere. Um, but my wife, she, just, she doesn't travel that much. So she's, she's going to be pretty much home only, maybe home and work. And if you see her coming in from Korea, hmm, something might not be right. Um, and does it look like fraud? Which we'll talk about. Is, it, is there any known fraudulent characteristics? I'll talk a bit about more that, about that in a second. Um, but for now, the idea is using the device as an identifier is another credential, the third factor of credential. We then take this, and now we do what I said earlier. It's no longer a binary decision. We have to look at a whole slew of things and make a risk assessment. Are we comfortable that we want to let George in to view what claims to be George's online banking account? So, let me see, uh, the right security at the right time, balanced security and usability, and uh, second authentication for high-risk transactions. So how does this work? So George on the, your left, on the left over there, comes in, and we're, we're going to do a real-time risk assessment. Do we think this is George? We're going to look at his machine device characteristics that I talked about a minute ago, and look at his network information. We're going to actually look and see if he matches any um, known fraudulent patterns, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and is this normal behavior for George? Then we're going to go into policy settings for this site. Well, what is George trying to do? Is he just trying to log in, maybe look at balance? Well, you know, it's not his normal machine, but it is Sonoma, and it is Sonoma State University he's coming from. It could be one of his students, but, hmm, well, we're going to let him in. You know, it, it doesn't look too bad. He's just looking to do some inquiry against some balances, and there's nothing he can see because we X out the credit card numbers, and who cares? So we let him in. That assessment says, fine, low risk, let him in. 
Now, all of a sudden, he wants to move $1,000 to an account in Lithuania. Hmm, things have changed. <laughs> We're getting a little more riskier. That's not normal behavior for George. This isn't a machine, this is not his machine before, but it is a Sonoma State, and there's a lot of bright students there, so you never know what's going on. Uh, so maybe we better challenge him again. And so then we go into policy, says go into a challenge scenario. And then the challenge scenario could be whatever, you know, the, the provider decides, w warrants the risk for the account, for, for, the, for the transaction. Um, many banks are starting simple. Um, I don't know if anybody here banks with Bank of America. They have a product called PsyKey, which is actually the Passmark product. And I'll, I'll, again, I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and they're using uh, knowledge-based questions, simple questions that you had to register when you signed up for PsyKey. Um, you can also have an out-of-band uh, confirmation. We can send an SMS with a one-time password. You can call your phone with text-to-speech and verbally say, George, to continue, please type in 47394. We can send an email with the same. We can send an AOL message. There's, there's lots of ways, you know, we can look to reconfirm uh, the transaction. But you know, this is the kind of mechanism which you're seeing deployed now in most of the financial services um, uh, companies globally. And, and this is the stuff that, um, that I work with and work on at, at RSA. So let's talk a little bit more um, about the modeling piece of this. I am completely fascinated with uh, behavioral modeling, I got to admit. I, now, as George said, um, uh, George and I met as I was in your shoes, and he was standing up here as a teacher, waving his arms, and uh, I was a computer science major. And now I've learned a little bit about modeling. I've worked with uh, some really good math people that understand these neural net and behavioral and Bayesian models really well. It's fascinating. They learn things, you give them facts, these would be, these aren't related in this slide, this would be facts, IP address, device identifier, uh, original profile for George. These facts come into these models, and these models then score, do we think that's normal for George? Is something ab abnormal here? Um, and then they tr you train them as to what's good and bad behavior. So, so they, they get trained uh, as to how, how um, if this looks like um, abnormal or normal behavior. So what we, I'm trying to think, I don't usually go into this level of detail when I talk, but for this group, I'm trying to think of some examples. So, so for example, a device identifier, we talked about this. Yeah. If the device, what we do is, the device identifier information is this. Here, here's the device George is on, and here's the list of history we've seen for George. Those two things are facts, right? We've seen George on this device 20 times in the past two weeks. That's a lot. We've never seen George on this device before. That's nothing. Th those are the facts. Th this Bayesian model takes a look at those facts and comes up with a risk probability. If it's a device we've never seen them on before, the risk is high. So it's, the risk is 1. So it's, it goes from 0 to 1. It's analog. So the risk might be 1 or 0.9 for, for, for this particular item. There's many items, right? Um, or it's a device we've seen them on 20 times in the past six months, or 50 times in the past six months. It's pretty safe. This is the same device for George. So this, this is the risk. This model, this, this piece of the model is, is, is gauging the risk that this is a device George has used before. It's not gauging the overall risk. It's just gauging the risk that this is a device George has used before. So it's going to create a score for that. Again, the score is going to be zero for no risk and one for highest risk. Probably it's going to be 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 5, 6, 3, 9, 4, 2, 7, something like that. So, and the way these, the way these models get trained is we give them lots of real examples. So we take real data of hundreds and thousands, thousands and thousands of people take their normal behavior. So like at Bank of America, we take all their logins and over a six-month period and see how many times someone has logged in from this device. And then they, they repeat coming in. And so that's good behavior. That, 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 that would be normal behavior. Or, or it's the first time we've, we've never seen a this device before. That would be, you know, it's not the same device. So we, we train the model in what, be, what, what normal behavior looks like. And that's how it learns to set the scores. And then it sets the scores. Now in the case of fraud, so, so these are, well, one sec. So these are models that just sort of give the probability of a single item. 
And these are the single items. This is a device we've seen George on before. Other items might be, this, does, this look like a, um, does this look like a fraudulent device? Have we seen this IP address or device fingerprint on a, associated with fraud? That would be a fraudulent device, right? The probability that this, that this device has been associated with fraud. So those things go into what's called a neural net model. The, now the neural net takes in all of these probability scores and then comes up with a final score. And, and, and that's the one you train with truth markings. So you give all these scores into it, you, you train it with real data, and you mark the real data which ones were really fraud. And that's how it learns. And then you loop it through these models, and that's how they learn behavior. Fascinating. And it works. I mean, I've seen this. I've done it. As a programmer, if I had to do this with if-then-else statements, I'd be programming for months and months and months. You know, I, we were able to build models like this you know, in a day. Just how much data you can crunch. There's a lot of data crunching that goes on. But um, as far as logic programming goes, it's very, very simple. And then this is a case of a fusion model where you're, you're maybe taking two models as, as William, this fellow I work with that does this, says, you might have two doctors. One's good at this, one's good at that. And so you're going to take two opinions and come up with a combined opinion. He worked for the um, de Defense Department for a while, and they were trying to detect if a vehicle coming down the road was a Scud missile launcher or an ambulance. And they had these sensors all around that would do that. And he said the best sensor was smell, a smell sensor, because these Scud missile launchers had this really strong odor. <laughs> And they were a great sensor. But the wind sensor, if it was a windy day, you couldn't pay attention to the sense sensor because the wind could be shifted in the wrong direction. So if it was a windy day, you'd flip from this model to that model. And that's what the fusion does. It, it takes into consideration it's a windy day, so don't pay too much attention to this guy and not pay more attention to that guy. That's how all this stuff works. OK. Um, so I had said earlier, so what we, well, how we apply this in the financial services sector, facts go in, risk models go in, do the risk engine. We just talked about that. Risk scores come out, site policies I talked about come out. You have a policy manager, it comes back with an action. That's how these systems work. Um, so, we also find that once you start getting involved in a lot of uh, fraudulent um, interaction, watching fraud, seeing fraud, marking fraud, I mean, credit card fraud, bank fraud, they, the banks know, the financial services sector knows when fraud occurs. They get, they have to, they get the call from the customer. They gotta, they gotta, fix, they gotta make the account whole. You know, we will mark bad IP addresses. We'll mark bad devices. We'll share those bad IP addresses with other banks or financial, financial companies that are part of our network. So if somebody notices that George's account got compromised from this IP address XYZ, We'll put it in our fraud network as a probability of strong probability of fraud. If the XYZ shows up someplace else, they know it's fraud. So here's a quick example of that. So here's three banks, let's call them. This is a real, this is real data, by the way. So uh, in client, client, really, client A should be bank A, bank B, bank C. So you can see here on December, we got some activity up there. Um, that the same account, the suffix account number, 4007, came in um, within about six minutes from the time on the left from uh, Norway, Bahamas, and Venezuela. Wow, bingo. That sets off an alarm on our, our scoring stuff. It's called uh, velocity. You, he traveled faster than an airplane could travel. Okay. Can't happen. Now, could still be okay. Could be he's using proxies, could be he's on a corporate network and got, he got routed around someplace, could be he switched from one network to another. Might be okay, might not be okay. It's risky. It looks riskier. So we put it, hmm, looks a little bit riskier. Let's stick it up in our shared network and be a little more cautious now with that IP address. Well, now we see in another bank, the same IP address is coming in from Venezuela and doing some things with a different account. Hmm, same day, a little bit later, a couple hours later. Looks a little more riskier, a different IP address and the same device identifier. Um, well, back to the other bank, and they're coming in, um, and we're seeing that same device identifier being used to try to access some more accounts. So you can see how this works. Um, as soon as, and then it's right now they're still suspicious, and the suspicion level's rising as we see more of this activity. As soon as one of the banks confirms fraud, then it hits the roof, 
And then we start going backward in time to see where else we've seen this and try to see if it's been accounts compromised in the past. So I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to keep going on this. You get the idea, right? Um, here's an actual case study. Uh, Halifax Bank of Scotland in, in the UK launched a system to do this kind of fraud detection. They had fraud that looked like this. This was their fraud, a lot of fraud. Um, after launching this system, it just it dribbles down. So we see about a good 80, 90 percent fraud deduction, fraud detection by using techniques like this. Um, this is Psyche. Uh, I talked, some of you said your Bank of America companies, uh, customers. Um, this was what Passmark was famous for. It had done the two-way and, and two-factor being the device as the second factor. The idea being, I, I really don't like the screen. I'm not too crazy about that dog, but this is, this is their training screen. Um, the idea would be you give your username, but not your password. We look at the device. Do we think it's George's device? If we think it's George's device, we show George his personal image. Only George and the bank know his personal image. It's something he set during registration. He might have uploaded his own picture. B of A doesn't allow, but others do. Maybe a family member vacation spot. When he sees his image, he knows it's the right bank, and then he types in his password, and now he can continue. So he knows it's the bank, and the bank knows it's him because of his device. So that was the whole idea behind Passmark. Um, another example of it, a little bit better picture, Alliance and Leicester in the UK. Um, we're starting to see fraud now cross channels. Fraudsters, as I said, are eternally motivated to figure out how to compromise your money. Um, so a lot of banks have tightened down the web channel. Well, guess what? They're moving to the phone channel. So now they'll go into the web channel, they'll do some small stuff, gain some information about you in inquiry only, and they'll call the call center, and they'll sweet talk the call center agent to think it's George and move money out of George's account. So now we're building models and we're doing this to look at patterns where there's a setup going on in the web and now detecting it on a call center channel. Okay, I'm getting close um, to, my, to my ending here. Um, so, you know, in my mind, authentication needs to be adaptive. I, again, it can't be binary any longer. Um, I truly think, and we were seeing this, but I think you'll see more and more of this, and I think it will start spilling out. You start to see with social networking, Look at uh, the virtual worlds. You know, there's uh, the, uh, World of Warcraft and and and, all, and a lot of the virtual games. You know, they're selling those items on eBay. They're 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 worth something. Um, my daughter a few years ago had Neopets idea. I think it was Neopets she had. I forget which one it was. And somebody tricked her into giving her a password, and then she realized it and they changed it right away. Then she, when she went in, all the stuff that she collected was gone. It's transferred to somebody else. The stolen. Yeah. So people are, are stealing virtual things. Now, is that a crime? Hard to say. Yeah. So you know, I, I think you'll start seeing this beyond the financial services sector into other other areas. Uh, any place where there's valuables, you know, the criminal world is figuring out how to compromise. So the cornerstone of it, I think, is a risk engine, a policy uh, engine, and, and a shared fraud network. You know, and, and for our systems at RSA, those, those, are, the, those are the core with the risk-based authentication. You know, then you've got lots of different um, authentication types um, that can be applied. I said earlier, if you tell me a solution you think will work, I'll tell you a compromise around it. Unfortunately, almost every one of these can be compromised. Almost every one. I'll, I'll give one that I think is pretty good. Um, you know, even the RSA tokens, they can be compromised. They can be compromised by having a man in the middle, a site you type it into, it says, thank you. It turns around, now the person's got it and they use it themselves within that 30 second time window perhaps. If it's one of those event based ones, it's even easier. They can just store it and use it anytime they want in the future. Um, malware on the machine. Guys, there's malware. You probably know this. I see the stats. I, you'll see a few slides in a second. Um, Malware is every place. And most banks, FIs, uh, governments are very, very concerned with, with malware on machines. Once you've got malware on the machine, I can, I can do almost anything I want. I can see anything I want. I can grab anything I want. I can wait for you to log in with triple, dipple, login, retina based, fingerprint, high end, OTP security. And once you're logged in, then I'm going to issue a transaction and move money. There's, there's a way around this stuff. Actually, the one, the one I like the most, what I, I call is transaction signing. I, I, I like that the most. 
uh, let me combine that with EMV. In, in, in the UK, um, smart cards have taken off quite a bit more. And so there's a lot of smart cards out there. And they're looking to issue readers where you put your card in, it'll generate a one-time password. Over there, I can actually type in an account number and an amount and hit sign, and it digitally signs it. I think you guys understand when I say digital signature. It's like one of those hashing things that comes out with a signature. It's bound to the detail of the transaction. If I can digitally sign a transaction detail, that gets pretty safe, something separate. I, I sort of like that. Problem is, now you've got everybody carrying around these things and signing their transactions. It gets a little cumbersome. I'm a little uh, optimistic with cell phones, the way they're going. I think, we, I think we'll be seeing more of uh, cell phone applications that are more um, can, for providing more security to everybody. Um, I envision a day where you start using your cell phone for payments authorization. I might want to put in George Ledeen, $1,000. I hit sign. It signs it locally on the cell phone. And then it sends a transaction. Now it's bound together. Of course, you know, iPhone and stuff like that. There could be malware on the cell phone. Semantic and Mac McAfee are also looking at that world. So that might not be safe for too long, too. You know, you need to have something separate, physically separate. Um, it's a constant game of cat and mouse with the fraudsters. And... Why? So why does it need to be adapt? Uh, uh, why does uh, authentication need to, to be adaptive? Why is it a game of cat and mouse? Well, it's about the fraudster underworld. Um, uh, one of the things that we do at RSA is we, we get our fingers dirty, sort of. We, we get involved with the fraudster community. We actually pretend to be fraudsters on the internet. We actually interact with fraudster forums, and I'll show you those fraudster forums in a second. There's a whole ecosystem there. There's a whole supply chain. There's a whole, there's a whole set of, uh, of roles and responsibilities that exist in the Froster underworld. On the left, you've got uh, the yellow boxes. I call them the, uh, you know, uh, pocket change folks. You know, they're the ones that will just sell or rent stuff to you. You know, hey, you want a list of emails? I got it, hundred dollars. You want some uh, personalized emails? You want some hijacked computers, a botnet to send out scams from? I'll rent you time on botnet, thousand uh, dollars an hour. No problem. Um, you want some phishing kits, how to set it up? You want to send out spam mails? You want to have a collector that collects the mails it comes to, puts up a Bank of America site, collects the data, gives you the data, sends it to an email address you want someplace? I got that. I'll give you the source code, $5,000, or just the binary, just give me $1,000. These guys do all that. It's out there. I'll show you in a second. Now, are they breaking the law? It's hard to say. Did they break the law? I don't know. This guy, he's the one that puts it all together. He, he's the fraudster. He's the phishing fraudster. He, he, he buys the rootkits. He buys, the, he buys the, um, the emails. He rents on the botnet. He sets up the server. He sets everything up. He hits send. Out goes 100,000 emails. He waits for the suckers to come back in and give their information. And I've seen this. I've seen the collection sites. <laughs> rows and rows of name, address, credit card number, CVV number, date of birth, SSN, password. It's just It's there. People just supply it. They don't know any better. Um, a friend of mine said, hey, listen, there's always plan B. You know, if, give me $1,000, I'll give you $10,000 back in a few weeks. I know how this works. So he gets the data, but he's typically not the one that's moving it out of the bank, moving the money out of the bank. There's still one more player. It's usually local crime rings that are moving the money out of the bank. Um, mule accounts, someone that's local in the regional area. So he'll typically sell these to the local crime rings and they'll move the money out. They'll typically, they're taking the biggest risk because they're on the front lines. They'll typically get 70, 80 percent of the take. He'll get 20, 30 percent of the take. And these guys are working for pocket change. And that's how the ecosystem works. Um, here are some, you know, tool builders, do it yourself. I'll give you a, a kit that has an opening page, login page, product, collects name, address, SSN, credit card number. I'll sell it to you. Oops, I'll sell it to you for $320 via e-gold or just buy it from me. Uh, here's another one. I've got this Trojan. It steals money from e-gold accounts. Um, I'll give it to you $1,000. Source code's $5,000. You know, c contact me through ICQ. We can do business. This is real stuff. This, this is all real stuff here. Um, let me see. What does this say? You don't need details. Here, the same the Trojan thing again. All you got to do is infect them. Just send them an email and get them to click. Or find a vulnerability in a website that, that finds something on an unprotected machine. Once this gets installed, it's going to sit and watch for you to log into an account and steal your credentials. Um, here's a real fraudster bulletin board. There are bulletin boards out there that the fraudsters, the fraudsters need to interact. 
They need to buy this stuff. Um, FBI and Interpol used to shut them down. But, you know, they just pop up again. Finally, they just leave them up and they watch what's going on. The fraudsters know they watch what's going on. We, we gave a talk one time where we talked about this. It was in U.S. News. And the next day on the bulletin board, they said, hey, we're in U.S. News. They were so happy. They don't care. They're all anonymous. They know how to, they know how to cover their tracks. They have, so they have a whole community out there. Um, you know, talk cash, world news, what's new, chit chat, uh, just join, introduce yourself. There's a whole one-on-one, how to be a fraudster, learn how to be a fraudster. This is the interesting part. Look at this. Verified vendors. There's a whole reputation system. I'm a verified vendor. George knows me. You can trust me. George has been around a long time. We can do business. I'm verified. I'm a made man, right? Uh, buy, sell, trade with, uh, with um, non-verified vendors. Eh, you know, you don't know so-and-so over there. You, you can do business with him, but be careful. He's not verified. We don't know who he is. He might be RSA. He might be Interpol. He might be FBI. Hey, not sure who he is? Don't worry. The bulletin board will provide an escrow service. We'll just take 4%. No problem. Give us the money when you get the goods, and we'll release the money. It's okay. We can help you get going. You want to get verified? We'll help you get verified. Rippers, these guys, you know, he, I did visit with him, he ripped me off, be careful for this guy, he's no good, he's FBI, he's RSA, he's a, he's a mole, he's someplace, somebody you don't, want to, you don't want to do business with. We would keep various identities and over time. I mean, people work this, that's, that's how it works out there. Fake documentation, what do you want to know? The whole one-on-one stuff. Passports, birth certificate, diplomas, you guys, you know, sitting in, you want a diploma, just go, just go here. You get a diploma, it's no problem, I'll sell it to you. Uh, carding is all credit cards. Everything you want to know about carding. Uh, forms, hacking, cracking, uh, everything you want to know about rootkits, trojans, botnets. It's all right there. You want to be anonymous? Here's, here's everything you want to know about anonymous. You could drill down all this stuff. You want some website templates and scripts to build websites, fishing cards, buy that from the pocket change folks? Just go down the bottom there. Click in there. You'll find a whole bunch of stuff there for sale. Here's one of them drilled down. Um, I got dumps. Dumps a credit card. It's actually a piece of real plastic. Uh, special offer. My dump. My plastic for sale. I'll sell you real plastic with U.S. you know, bank, uh, U.S. bank or whatever bank logo on it. Just give me the numbers. We'll emboss them. The whole thing. It's it's a holy. Here, this guy over here. HSBC UK account with seventeen hundred pounds in there. So a little bit thirty five hundred dollars. Um, they were selling that for about three hundred pounds. So again, that's a take rate. You know, he sells for three hundred. Somebody moves money out. They get the rest of the money. They checked them all. Um, oh, well, that was it. I'm on time, 12.45. So um, yeah, the world of authentication is, a, it is really changed to be something you've got to look at everything that's going on. There's a lot of criminals out there. Uh, be careful with your identity. Don't respond to emails no matter what. Uh, be careful with giving out your personal information. I don't know if you have questions or anything, or George, how much time you got? Sure, we have time you guys have any questions? If not, yes? I've seen a few of the cases of multi factor authentication inside the Bank of America uses. And oftentimes, they've noticed that they're vulnerable to account harvesting because if you type in an invalid username, it'll tell you that it's invalid before it gets to the other authentication steps. Right. What would you say, think of, think would be a way to yeah. that kind of attack? Um, yeah, username harvesting is 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 a is a, is a bit of an, it, something you have to be careful of when you have these systems where you ask for username without password. When you ask for username and password at the same time, you could just say something was wrong, and they don't know which one. They don't know what's a real username, so you can't harvest usernames. This is your question, right? Yeah. So when you have a system where it's just username, and, and then they get challenged or see the uh, the image, you know, well then they can sort of get information if you say sorry, username is not valid. So I think that's what Bank of America does. I think you're right. Um, other implementations we have, what we'll do is we'll put them the bogus challenge questions. And, and so you can't really tell. You know, it, it's really a risk management decision. Um, the bank felt, I think Bank of America, I can't speak for Bank of America directly. They made their own policy decisions. But, you know, the bank felt that they could manage it. The, the customer experience was better to say it's not right, try again. And the risk, mat the risk of it, you know, they, manage, they have lots of different things they do to manage risk. What you see on Bank of America's site is just, you know, the very, very, very tip of the iceberg. There's so much that goes on behind that. So they, they felt comfortable with that risk. It's, it's really just a matter of, you know, what your comfort level is within the institution for, for particular risks. It's a good point, though. 
Yes? Do you do any online banking or purchasing online yourself? <laughs> you know, I give this talk and I, I often say, um, I don't use a credit card online. I once, rarely I do. And it's true, r rarely I do. Once in a while I do. Um, online banking, you know, I'll, I'll be, I've got to make sure I'm from a trusted machine. Once in a while I'll do that. I mean, uh, my wife does most of the bill pay, fortunately, and all. She, my, my wife, she buys, you know, Christmas, everything online. Her credit card's been stolen three times. My credit card's never been stolen. So, you know, um, I would like it, and, and you know, I, I personally see the world moving toward um, sort of a service where I, I can opt in. Now, my daughter, she's almost your age, um, you know, she would could care less, right, her credit card. She'd use, who cares, you know, I'll just use it. You know, credit card, you are covered. The credit card company and the issuing bank will cover you for, for your losses. So you're not liable. Um, I would like it, though, so if I could associate um, sort of a degree, I could associate a credential with my, my account number, my credit card number. So I said, if you see my credit card number, send me an SMS message, or require I use this OTP, or this USB port, or, or something special, or call me on the phone, or do something. Now, my wife might not care. My daughter definitely wouldn't care. Right? So I, I envision the world moving towards sort of self-defined credential levels. Um, and there's things that we're actually working with with some entities to look at this. Um, there's a thing called Verify by Visa. Probably none of you have heard of it. It's more popular in the UK where you're challenged every time you use your credit card on the internet for username and password. So I envision that with risk analysis, challenge for username and password, maybe other stronger credential types. And I can opt in and define here for me, make it this level. Then I'd feel more comfortable. I think we will see more authenticators and credentials in the future. But it might be not be ubiquitous. It might be sort of, I, I want it, so I'm going to sign up for it because I care more. Yeah? What's your take on the, uh, like they say, like the virtual like, credit card where every time you want to use it, it changes, like the, not only the card number, but the you know, security key on the back. Yeah, some one time credit card numbers, right? Yeah, it's great. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a demo that I had seen that some of us were working on where it takes what I just said a minute ago, verify by Visa. And have you seen info cards or card space from Microsoft? It's, it's with Vista. It's a new metaphor where uh, you use a card. It looks like a graphical card to sign in. So you go to do a credit card transaction. Up will come this card for you to sign with a username and password. You sign in, and it dynamically creates a one-time credit card number and it gives that to the merchant. And you don't even have to deal with it. You don't even have to touch it. This, this, is, not, this is not production yet. This is prototype stuff. But... Um, yeah, I, I see it moving towards that area. There was a lot of experiments with one-time credit cards in the past, and they, they, they didn't take off, primarily because they were just cumbersome to use. You know, how do you get the new number? How do you route it through? But once you have these sort of automated wallets that might help facilitate things, it might get more attractive. The question is, will the automated wallets ever take off? Wallets were tried a while back and failed. The MIDI with Microsoft's card space and info cards might be another chance. We'll see. Great. Thank you.